Boys and girls and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you something that I've not made and it's not my mind, but I'm riding on the coattails of one of my sons. When we moved to Wee War, uh, one of the first people that I met was Paul Carl. Uh, it was a slightly intimidating meeting. Uh, I met his wife, Jean. That was less intimidating. Uh, but we'd heard a number of stories about Paul and Jean Carl. And, and one of them was that Paul had been a, a bomber uh, pilot during the Second World War. And uh, during the Second World War, he'd flown B-17 bombers over Europe. Uh, he had a claim to fame. He was the only American bomber pilot to be shot down and land his plane without losing any crew, which was remarkable. Spent a number of years, uh, a period of time in a prison of war camp. And uh, my family was fascinated by some of his stories. Uh, I can't remember what year it was, but Paul and Jean bought Seth and Baxter two model aeroplanes of the B-17 bomber. Now, I uh, am not a man who has been too enamoured with doing models. I don't have a mechanical bone in my body, which is a great disappointment to my father, who's an aeronautical engineer before he became a minister. But our boys loved putting these models together. Uh, in fact, Baxter finished his model the morning Paul died and Seth finished his just a little afterwards. Uh, Seth's, I think, has got a number of wartime scars and so can't be shown. But this is Baxter's. And for those two boys, those models were very powerful tools. They could, uh, they could imagine the, the plane that Paul flew in. They could see where the guns were and uh, how it might go through the air. They could mimic the battles as they fought each other. Uh, models are great, aren't they, like that? Uh, they're powerful tools because they give us a picture of something bigger. That's the way models work. I mean, if you tried to fly in that at the moment, it wouldn't work real well, would it? But it shows you what the greater reality is. That's what models do. They show you the greater reality. Uh, in many ways, what we've been doing last week and this week is looking at God's model of his promise in the nation of Israel. Israel serves as a model for us. Uh, they experience the greatness of the promises of God. They have a land of their own. They are numerous, over a million, last time we saw them. They've got God's spoken word to them, which they understand that they will obey in a covenant with God. And God blesses them and gives them a symbol to show that he wants to live with them, a, a tent but they're only partial fulfilments, aren't they? They're only a model pointing to the greater reality because how does Israel go with obedience? Well, they stumble every day of the week. How do they go with dwelling perfectly with God? Well, they stumble every day of the week. How do they go with well, all sorts of areas so that when we look at Israel, we see a wonderful model pointing to a greater reality because there's a problem that remains, isn't there? And what's the problem that remains? It's the problem of sin. And we see it as Israel, the descendants of Abraham, live out their life stumbling time and time again against the backdrop of God's faithfulness. And as we look at that model, we know that there is a greater reality, something bigger coming where sin will be dealt with once for all. I'm going to pray and we're going to look at this model together. Dear God, thanks for your word. I thank you for the rain. Thank you for gathering us together. Thank you that we can sit here. Thank you that we can open your word. Father, we're going to cover a lot today. It's a reminder of how constant you are over so many years. Father, things might seem disjointed and a little all over the place, but help us to see how you are bringing together your kingdom, your people in your place under your rule and blessing. Please apply it to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, we've been using a, a book by Vaughan Roberts, God's Big Picture. We're continuing that in our Bible studies. Uh, Vaughan uh, has tried to understand the, the big theme that holds the whole Bible together, which is the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, we have God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. I remember we saw that way back at the start, Garden of Eden, God's people, Adam and Eve living in God's place, the garden. Under God's rule and blessing, I'm going to give you everything, just not that tree. Obey me. And they did not so well with that. 
And so we saw the perished kingdom in Genesis 3 where God's people are kicked out, passed out, forced out, judged out into a world. The world is broken because they chose to be God instead of God. They doubted the goodness of God's word. And so God then promises to restore the kingdom to a bloke called Abram. Nothing to recommend Abram, was there? An idol worshipper who lied, who committed adultery, who didn't trust God. But God chose him and said, through your family, Abraham, I'm going to restore my kingdom. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to put you in a land and I'm going to bless you under my word. And Abram trusted God. God worked in him. And so last week we saw what happened with the family of Abram, Abraham now and Sarah. They're now as they've God started to do what he promised. They're a nation of over a million people. So they're great, but not as numerous as the stars in the heavens like he promised. Uh, They're his people with his law. They've got a job to do. They're to represent him to the world. And God says, I want to live with you, but you're sinful. So we've got these sacrifices. So it's a partial blessing, isn't it? And this week we're going to look at the whole idea of the land and what it means to live under the rule of God. We're covering a lot of territory, aren't we? And so we need to work hard at this and we'll move quickly, but there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. I'm at point two on the outline. Remember that God made this promise. The Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I'll show you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. A lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan. The land that was promised was Canaan. Abraham travelled right through it. God said, you'll have, well, no, you're not going to see it fully in your possession, are you? But in more than 400 years' time, your people will come here and that moment's come. God saved his people. God's brought them out. God has brought them to the edge of this land and they're ready to go in. And so in Numbers chapter 13, the Lord spoke to Moses Send men to scout out the land of Canaan I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the Lord's command. All the men were leaders in Israel. How many spies? Twelve spies. They went into the land. Yep, and the land was already inhabited. That's a fly in the ointment, isn't it? I'm going to give you a land, but someone's already bought the real estate. And 10 of the men come back and say, it's impossible. I mean, it's bountiful, it's beautiful. Uh, It takes a number of us just to carry a bunch of grapes, but it's impossible. In fact, the grapes are good, but the stew in Egypt was better. Let's go back there. That would be a smart thing to do, wouldn't it? You've got to remember that it's only a matter of weeks since they saw what God did in Egypt. Two of them say, no. Look at what God's done, Caleb and Joshua. God has always done as he promised. He'll give us the land. Well, God judges his people. God, this is the remarkable thing. God always does as he says. Why are we surprised? Trust me. But if you don't trust me, I'll give you what you want, which is life without me. And so you can wander for 40 years in this desert looking over the river at the land I promised you until everyone over the age of 20 is wiped out because you did not trust me. Only Caleb and Joshua will see the land. Finally, at the start of Deuteronomy, God's people are gathered together back there after wandering around. Moses gives them three sermons. You only get one each Sunday. They got three on the plains of Moab. And each of the sermons is a reminder of the promise of God. It's remarkable. Go and read those sermons because all the generation at Mount Sinai has died out. But Moses speaks to these men and women as if they were there. That's how the promise works. And he reminds them that God has given them a job. What's their job? To represent him to the world. They'll do that by obeying his commandments which display him. And as they do that, people in the universe will come back to God and it will be wonderful. Deuteronomy 28, now if you faithfully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all his commands, i.e. if you represent me 
The Lord your God will put you above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come and overtake you because you obey the Lord your God. There's also a warning, isn't there? In Deuteronomy 28 verse 15, but if you do not obey the Lord your God, if you don't represent me by carefully following all my commands and statutes I'm giving you today, all these curses will come and overtake you. We're meant to remember losing the Garden of Eden, aren't we, with that language, curse? You have a very clear job. You are to represent God to the world. God has given you his clear revelation so you know what he is like. And if you represent him, God will be rolling back sin. But if you don't, well, Moses knows what God's people are like, doesn't he? He, he's just spent 40 years wandering in the desert with them. And so he knows what their hearts will do, what their tendency is. He knows what will take place. Deuteronomy 30, when all these things happen to you, the blessings and the curses I've set before you, and when you come to your senses while you're in all, in all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and all your soul by doing everything I'm giving you today, then he will restore you. Did you pick up what Moses says there? You will end up being cursed because you've got a problem called sin and I will remove you but I will remain faithful. It's one of those key themes, that kind of backdrop, that rhythm section for the whole song of the Bible of the faithfulness of God. And so they get ready to enter that land that God has promised them in the book of Joshua. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, who'd served Moses. Remember Joshua, way back there, 40 years, so he's no spring chicken. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Do you notice why they will take the land? Better fighters, sharper swords, better provisions? No, no, they will take the land because God is in charge. God will do as he promised. And when they are to go in, what are they to do when they go in? They had to wipe everyone out. Now, I want to pause there because what I just said sounds pretty appalling, doesn't it? In fact, if you're someone who has lived through the last 20 or 30 years, you'll know that this sounds remarkably like ethnic cleansing, perhaps even genocide. And this is God <laughs> saying this to his people so he can roll back sin. Sounds pretty strange, doesn't it? Uh, it? It does sound strange. Let's let's not avoid that fact. But I think I think we can understand a little bit about what's going on here when we remember two facts that God's already laid out. Uh, for example, in Genesis 15, when God spoke to Abram, God said, "I will use your people as a tool of judgment." Regardless of what George Bush Sr. says or other politicians in the world, this is the only holy war. Because the practices of the Canaanites in the land were what? They were truly appalling. They ranged from everything to do with child sacrifice through to ritual prostitution as a way to win the favour of your gods. And God had been very clear. Remember, Abram had lived there, so they'd seen the alternative and they'd chosen to ignore it. And so God says, I'll judge you like he does with every human being. And so I think that's one fact we've got to have in there. I I think the second fact is this. When God's people are to represent him, they're to represent him undiluted. You can't represent half of God or a little bit of God. Or this characteristic of God, because I like that one, but not those ones. So when they go into the land, they are to represent God faithfully, without dilution, without distraction, without having a bet both ways. 
And so they go in and they possess the land. Joshua 21 verse 43 So the Lord gave Israel all the land he'd sworn to their fathers and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest. There's the rest lost since Genesis 3. The Lord gave them rest on every side according to all he'd sworn to their fathers. None of their enemies were able to stand against them for the Lord handed over all their enemies to them. None of the good promises the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled. Isn't that good? They're in the land. It's fulfilled. But I want you to listen carefully to what Joshua says just a chapter later, Joshua 23, verse 11. So be very diligent to love the Lord your God for your own well-being. For if you turn away and cling to the rest of the nations remaining among... Hang on. Did he just say that? Because God's people didn't obey God. They came to this tribe and went, oh, actually, those guys have got some really good weapons. We should make an alliance with them. It's the only way we're going to get any weapons that have copper in them. And those guys' agricultural practices, they're really, really productive. We, we'll make an alliance with them too. And the women of that tribe, that's what God's people did. They constantly made alliances with the people. So it was only partial, wasn't it? And they still had to make a decision. It's precarious because they've showed what their hearts are like. Will they obey God and remain faithful? Well, there's the land. Uh, It it brings us to point three on the outline, to the idea of a king, which seems really strange because a king's not mentioned in that promise to Abram, is he? But if you flick back through the books that you've just looked at, through Genesis or right through to Judges, you'll see kings are lurking everywhere. Genesis 3.15 One of Eve's descendants will rule and defeat the devil, the pretend king. Uh, When Jacob blesses his sons in Genesis 49, the tribe of Judah will have kings. In Deuteronomy 17, as Moses proclaims these sermons on the plains of Moab, he says that you will have a king under God, under God's authority. And so we come to the book of Judges and they enter into the land. Uh, Every time you read the book of Judges, it feels like you need to have a shower afterwards, doesn't it? Uh, It's just one of the toughest books in the Bible to read. Uh, It's grimy. uh, It's gritty. uh, It's gruesome, isn't it? Uh, It's appalling for many people. Uh, It has this repeated refrain right throughout it, doesn't it? At least four times, finishes with it. In those days there was no king and every man did as he desired. That's going to work for a nation, isn't it? When they promise to obey God. And so you get this continual cycle. It's not a cycle, it's actually a spiral, isn't it? Downwards. Where God's people say, we're going to obey you, but then they disobey God and God does what he says. Funny that. And judges them. We saw that with someone like Goliath. And then they cry out to God and God sends them a rescuer. They're really not pin up men and women, are you? Those rescuers. They're quite bizarre. So you know who's doing the saving, that's God. And they restored and then what do they do again? Sin again. And the cycle spirals downwards. God is so patient. I start losing my temper when I step out of bed. God is so patient. So patient. With these people who say, I'll do this, but do this with the other hand. And each time it happens, you see the faithfulness of God. And so by the time you get to the end of the book in Judges 21 verse 25, the last verse, in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. You're looking for a king, aren't you? Someone to rule under God. And so when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 8, when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 8, the last of the judges, the greatest of the judges, we finally get that request. 1 Samuel 8. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah and they said to him, look, you're old. It's good to have people who talk to you clearly, isn't it? Look, you're old. Your sons do not follow your example. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us the same as all the other nations have. What a request. We want to be like everyone else. We don't want the job of representing God. We want to make our alliances. 
We want to look the same. So just give us a king. Because whatever you're doing, God's not working. It seems such a simple request, but what they want is a king instead of God, not a king under God. They want a king instead of God, not a king under God. So God gives them what they want. We want a king like every other nation. So here you go. You can have a tall, good-looking man who stands out, who's a good fighter. What's his name? Saul. He's like every other king, isn't he? Like every other nation. And he disobeys God like every other nation. Do you see how well that worked? So then God gives them David. 1 Samuel 13 verse 14. A man after God's own heart. Now I want to add just a little warning in here. I don't think that saying David was a moral man. Or an obedient man. Because we know he's not, don't we? We know he's not. So we've got to ask ourselves, what does it mean for David to be described as a man after God's own heart? I think it means that David will be the family line that will fulfill the plans of God. The desire of God. The heart of God, which is to roll back sin. And so he's appointed the successor to Saul. He takes rule at the start of 2 Samuel. And in 2 Samuel 7, that reading that Jeff brought us, God makes a covenant with him. Remember covenants? We've had a number in the Bible. A solemn agreement between two or more people with binding promises. We had that one with Noah. I'm not going to wipe out the world with water again and here's the rainbow. We had the one with Abram, 15 and 17 of Genesis. And then we had the one with God's people, Mount Sinai, represent me. And now we've got this one. And isn't it a remarkable covenant, if you remember back to what Jeff read? Because David does nothing. (laughs) Did you pick that up? God does everything. When he recounts David's life, what was David before God gave him the job? He was kicking sheep around a paddock. There was nothing to recommend him. He was the youngest, the smallest. He was the shepherd boy while all the others went to fight. And God chose him. And God will give him a house, a family line that will last forever. In fact, that family line is... Can you imagine being told by God that one of your descendants would be God's very own boy? Isn't that remarkable? That someone in your bloodline will be the son of God. And through that boy... God will establish his kingdom forever with someone in Abraham's family for the benefit of the whole universe. Well, don't place David on a pedestal yet. Uh, We know that he's a man who is disobedient. We know the judgment that comes on him in 2 Samuel 11 and 12 and afterwards. uh, Have you ever thought this? Uh, The judgment on David is that the sword of violence will never depart from his house. Have you thought about what that means for Jesus? Because the sort of violence is still there, isn't it, in the house of David? For the benefit of others. He's succeeded by his son Solomon. And Solomon, we know, is just wonderful, terrific, the wisest. And actually the Bible says that things reach a pinnacle here with Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, as Solomon dedicates the temple May the Lord be praised. He's given rest to his people Israel according to all he said. Not one of all the good promises he made through his servant Moses has failed. 1 Kings 4, God's people are numerous. 1 Kings 4, they're in God's place. 1 Kings 4, they have God dwelling with them and they are a blessing to every nation around them. It's there. Except for one thing. What's that one thing? Well, Solomon decides that the best way to make alliances is by marrying the daughters of foreign kings, doesn't he? So, God, I'm going to build this temple for you over there, but I've got these rooms in my house for all these other gods. God, I'm going to build your temple over there, but I don't trust you enough, so I've built stables for my war machines. 
And both times he disobeys clearly the commands of God in Deuteronomy. You see, there's that fly in the ointment called sin, isn't there? It's only partial. It's a model saying there's something greater to come and God's judgment comes on his people, doesn't it? Under Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the kingdom divides in a civil war. A public servant takes rule in the north, taking ten tribes with him. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, sets up a capital in Samaria, doesn't like people going over the border to Jerusalem, so gives them a decent religious alternative with golden calves, and we know how good they work. In the south, you have Rehoboam, Solomon's son. He's left with two tribes. They've still got the capital. They've still got Jerusalem, but they're not much different, are they? Within 200 years, what happens to the north? In 722 BC, just as God says, Assyria comes in and wipes them out. As God says in 2 Kings 17, quoting Deuteronomy 28, you disobeyed me and you are cursed. A little less than 200 years later, what happens to the south? Well, the family line of David is still there. But the Babylonians come in and by 586 BC, the southern kingdom is wiped out and what we heard in Deuteronomy 28 has come true. They did not represent God by obeying him. And so God did exactly as he said. He is so faithful. It's a partial fulfilment, isn't it? A taste, a touch, a model saying here is what God promised And there is a day coming when sin will be dealt with and that will be seen as a greater reality, bigger, more magnificent, covering the whole earth. There is something greater to come. So so we we do, we've we've got God's people, it's the Israelites, we've got a land that's called Canaan, it's got Jerusalem and the temple, they've got blessing, the law and the king. But they've got a problem and that's sin. Now let me finish very quickly by trying to apply this. I struggle to apply passages like this. Well, it's not passages, it's books, isn't it? Thousands of years in one go. Let me, let me make um, three suggestions. You might read the Old Testament this week. How do you read it? How do you understand it? I love being in the West. Max Pringle always sits here, just enough for me to reach him and clip him over the ear. But he always interjects and talks to me during the sermon. It's great. But Max says, Bernard, what am I doing with the Old Testament? I'm reading it. What am I doing with it? And here is my suggestion. You've got to read the Old Testament as our Bible showing movement from promise to fulfilment. Here's your key question every time you read the Old Testament. How does this move us closer to the greater fulfilment, the greater reality? What is going on? Uh, Secondly, we've got to remember not to settle with the model. You know what it's like when you go on holidays. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Why won't we just pull over here? This is just as good a place as any. We've got to do that with the Bible. So don't settle on the Old Testament as the end point. It's pointing to a greater reality which actually fulfills God's promise for the whole world, regardless of your skin colour, your ethnicity or where you live. This is God doing something about your heart. So aim for the end point. Which brings me to the final idea. The key issue here is what? Is it a piece of land? Is it a building? Is it a kingship? Now the key issue here is what? Human sin. Not the sin of Solomon, not the sin of the Israelites, not the sin of Abraham, not the sin of David, but human sin. The universal, natural desire to say, I am God and God is not. So as we read these events, we need to be going, how is this showing God dealing with a greater reality, which is human sin rolled back and God's blessing come? Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, Lord, we've covered a lot today and uh, we've seen the highs and the lows And we've gone from the gritty to the glorious. Uh, Father, help us to know that you are moving to bring your promise of your people in your place under your rule to fulfilment through the pages of the Old Testament. Thank you that as we read something like we did last year, Matthew's genealogy of Jesus.
we see where that leads. Help us to hold on to Jesus. Amen.